Nobel Prize in Literature for 2021 is awarded to the novelist Abdul Razak Gurna, born in Zanzibar, active in England, for his uncompromising and compassionate penetration of the effects of colonialism and the fates of the refugee in the gulf between cultures and continents. Hi everyone, in this video I'll talk about Abdul Razak Gurna, the winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature in 2021, which was announced on Thursday, October 7th. First I'll tell you about his life and then I'll talk about his novels and finally the themes that he writes with and also why he was given the Nobel Prize. So I'll answer all these questions as we go along this video. First let me talk about his life. Abdul Razak Gurna was born in 1948 on the island of Zanzibar in Tanzania, East Africa. However, when he was only six years old, there was a revolution in Zanzibar. The revolution toppled the Arab rule in Zanzibar. So during this revolution, there was a lot of violence committed against the Arabs and South Asians, Indians. And Abdul Razak Gurna, being an Arab himself, found it very hard to live on Zanzibar. So in 1968, he moved to the UK and claimed asylum. The island of Zanzibar was under the Arab rule for many centuries and then the Portuguese arrived and after that also the Arabs were the dominant group until 1964 when the local Africans deposed the Arab rule and as a result many Arabs and Indians fled the country and a lot of people were killed. Abdul Razak fled to the UK and claimed asylum. So this experience of being a refugee shaped a lot of his writing and a lot of his novels are based on this idea of displacement, people moving, migrating from one area to another and feeling loss and trying to come to terms with the idea of a different country, a different ide identity. In 1980, he moved to Nigeria and he worked there for two years. Then he moved back to the UK and he studied uh, literature, English and literature, and he became a professor of English and post-colonial literature at the University of Kent in Canterbury. And he has written extensively on Salman Rushdie, the Indian-British author, and he has recently retired from teaching. His first language is Swahili, but he also speaks Arabic, but he only writes in English. Abdul Razak Gurna has written 10 novels and his first novel is Memory of Departure published in 1987 and 1988 he published Pilgrim's Way and then Dotty but his most famous novel is Paradise which was published in 1994 it was shortly set for the Booker Prize and also Whitbread Prize and then his latest novel is Afterlives which was published in 2020 he's also published a few short story collections and also essays and criticism and so forth so le let me talk about some of his novels just briefly his most famous novel is Paradise Paradise is at once the story of African boys coming of age, a tragic love story and a tale of corruption of traditional African patterns by European colonialism. At 12, Yusuf, the protagonist of this 20th century odyssey, is sold by his father in repayment of a debt. From the simple life of rural Africa, Yusuf is thrown into the complexities of pre-colonial urban East Africa, a fascinating world in which Muslim black Africans, Christian missionaries and Indians from the subcontinent coexist in a fragile, subtle social hierarchy. Through the eyes of Yusuf, Gunra depicts communities at war, trading safari gone awry and the universal trials of adolescence. Then, just as Yusuf begins to comprehend the choices required of him, he and everyone around him must adjust to the new reality of European colonialism. The result is a page-turning saga that covers the same territory as the novels of Isaac Denison and William Boyd, but does so from a perspective never before available on that seldom chronicled part of the world. It is somewhat similar to The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad that they both go to Congo, but it's an alternative view of colonialism, not from European perspective, but from African perspective. This is perhaps similar to Taib Saleh's Season of Migration to the North, which I discussed in another video. In 1996, Gurna published Admiring Silence. It's about a man who escapes from his native Zanzibar to England, so it's very similar to his own experience. His furtive departure makes it unlikely that he will ever return, but he and his family agree a bright future lies ahead. He meets an English woman and they build a life together. She's writing a thesis on the narrative theory and he becomes a teacher in a crammed London school. His release is to weave stories, often fictional, for her and her comfortably suburban parents. Now this is very similar to a season of migration because
because in Season of Migration 2, the main protagonist goes to England and weaves a lot of romantic tales, but his motivation is to sleep with women, so he wants to woo a lot of women. These are romantic and reassuring tales of post-colonial Africa, of the scented terrace where he would sit and listen to his mother's lyrical voice. But for all these stories of warmth and hospitality, the man has not heard from his family since his departure, nor has he written to tell them of his new life. And then the barriers come down and he is able finally to return for a visit. He finds a different country, more ramshackle than he had ever imagined or remembered. A country that allows him to see his life with a new clarity. Out of this confrontation, he comes to understand the transformation that have befallen him. So silence becomes a very a major theme in his writing. And then his next novel in 2001, By the Sea, on a late November afternoon, Saleh Omar arrives at Gatwick Airport from Zanzibar, a faraway island in the Indian Ocean. With him, he has a small bag in which there lies his most precious possession, a mahogany box containing incense. He used to own a furnished shop, have a house, and be a husband and father, but now he is an asylum seeker from paradise. Silence, his only protection. Again, the idea of silence is very present. Meanwhile, Latif Mahmood, someone intimately connected with Saleh's past, lives quietly alone in his London flat. When Saleh and Latif meet in an English seaside, his story is unraveled. It's a story of love, betrayal, of seduction and possession, and of people desperately trying to find stability amid the maelstrom of their times. So Saleh, maybe it's somewhat related to Taib Saleh, the author of Caesar of Migration, uh, the Sudanese author. He also moved to England. So I, I think here the idea by the seaside, so Zanzibar, as you know, it's by sea and also the UK. His 2017 novel, Gravel Heart, which suggests like stone heart, Salim has always known that his father does not want him. Living with his parents and his adored uncle Amir in a house full of secrets, he's a bookish child, a dreamer haunted by night terrors. It is the 1970s and Zanzibar is changing. Tourists arrive and the island's white sands, obscuring the memory of recent conflict they longed for independence for British colonialism is swiftly followed by bloody revolution. When his father moves out, retreating into a disheveled introspection, Salim is confused and ashamed. His mother does not discuss a change, nor does she explain her absences with a strange man. Silence is layered on silence. So again, we see silence is very important in works of when glamorous Uncle Amir, now a senior diplomat, offers Salim an escape, the lonely teenager travels to London for college, but nothing has prepared him for the biting cold and, and seething crowds of this hostile city. Struggling to find a foothold and to understand the darkness at the heart of his family, he must face devastating truths about those closest to him and about love, sex, and power. Evoking the immigrant experience with an sentimental precision and a profound understanding, Gravel Heart is a powerfully affecting story of isolation, identity, belonging, and betrayal, and Abdul Razak Gunra's most astonishing achievement. And his latest novel, Afterlives, published in 2020, is set on Zanzibar. Restless, ambitious Ilyas was stolen from his parents by Schutztrupp Askari, the German colonial troops. After years away, he returns to his village to find his parents gone and his sister's Afia given away. Hamza was not stolen, but he was sold. He has come of age in Schutztrupp and the right hand of an officer whose control has ensured his protection but marked him for life. The century is young. The Germans and the British and the French and the Belgians and whoever else have drawn their maps and signed their treaties and divided up Africa. As they see complete dominion, they are forced to extinguish revolt after revolt by the colonized. The conflict in Europe opens another arena in East Africa where the brutal war devastates the landscape. Hamza does not have words for how the war ended for him. Returning to the town of his childhood, all he wants is work, however humble, and security, and the beautiful Afia. All these interlinked friends and survivors come and go, live and work and fall in love and shadow of a new war lengthens and darkens, ready to snatch them up and carry them away. Okay, now I'll talk about the, some of the themes in Abdul Razak Guna's novels and also the reason why he was given the Nobel Prize in Literature. Abdul Razak Guna's main theme and main topic is migration and refugees. It's no surprise because he was a refugee himself in the 1960s, so his own experience of moving from Zanzibar to the UK defined his own writing in many ways. As you know, in recent years, the issue of refugees and migration in Europe has been very prominent in the news and it has become very political. And the Nobel Committee acknowledges that the theme of refugees' disruption runs throughout his work. 
So the Nobel Committee took this opportunity to award a prize to somebody who writes about refugees. Especially in recent years, the far right in Europe have demonized refugees with scare tactics as if they are invading Europe and so forth. And the media has not been helpful either. In some of his novels, Abdul Razak Gurna has given refugees a human face and depict their stories as individual stories, that they are all individuals, not this group that are going to destroy Europe and so forth. While he acknowledges that refugees need protection and help, but they in return will, will also make contributions to the host country. In fact, a lot of innovations are because of refugees and migrants moving to a country and innovating industries and so forth. And I think the Nobel Committee sympathize with that idea. And the second reason I think he won the Nobel Prize is his settings. He comes from East Africa, island of Zanzibar, where a lot of people from different backgrounds live together. The Arabs, the Indians, and the Africans, and the Persians. So I think for the Nobel Committee, this region was very underrepresented in literature, in global literature. So his perspective is very unique. He gives a new perspective to colonialism, as well as today's politics in the region and in the world. He is the voice of East Africa. And I think the Nobel Committee took this opportunity to award the prize to somebody from that region. And perhaps he's the first from East Africa to receive a Nobel Prize in Literature. A third reason he received the Nobel Prize is his other theme, post-colonial literature. As we know, Gurna spent years teaching post-colonial literature at University of Kent. And he's very active. He actually writes a lot about Salman Rushdie and other post-colonial writers. So I think the Nobel Committee took this opportunity to award it to somebody with a new perspective. Some of his novels deal with colonialism in Africa, but not from a Western viewpoint, but from an East African viewpoint. Another thing that is unique about Abdul Raza Gurna's work is that he places family as the most important social unit, or individual as the most important social unit, not tribes or race or community. According to Anne Ajulu Okongo's paper, Reading Abdul Razak Gurna, Narrative Power and Human Relationships, the reason Gurna focuses on the family instead of community or race or group is precisely because he doesn't want to conflate politics with human stories. I think human stories become more powerful if the focus is on the individual rather than a group as an identity form. And Ajulu Okongo also points out that, that Abdul Razak Gurna's work, he uses power as a relational tool which is similar to the works of Michel Foucault, who argued that power is relational. It's not top-down, but it's side-to-side. -side. It's like a water container. When you move it one side, the water goes the other side. When you move the other side, the water goes the other side. Uh, so if you think about the colonialism, it's the first there were the Arabs who ruled the area, and then the colonial Europeans came and they ruled the area. And then the local people, they, they rose and toppled the regimes and gain independence. So it's basically one community taking over another community and back and forth. And that's how he sees power. I think this is very interesting because usually in colonial writing, the local people are victimized. They are seen as victims only and the colonials as oppressors. So in Gona's work, I think there's, there's more nuanced story of the colonials and the colonized. So it gives you a very unique perspective to what really happens among the individuals and how they experience these political shifts. Okay, now I'll tell you about his style of storytelling. According to Felicity Hunt, Gurner's characters try to tell stories as a coping mechanism. In the same way we saw in Arabian Nights, Sherazad tells stories to live another night. So storytelling is not just entertainment, but it's a way of surviving. It's, it's a way of defining your identity and your being as a human being. In a world that things are shifting so fast, it's the stories that can anchor us down and keep us afloat. And I think Abdul Razak Gona's writing is all about how to anchor yourself with stories and stories how you can survive and stories how you can keep your heads above water in a world that is shifting, people being displaced. I think it makes sense because Gurna was displaced as a young man and that resonates with a lot of people nowadays, people move countries. Migrants and refugees no longer feel connected or belong to a country, so the only way they can anchor themselves down is through stories. Now, there's also a paradox in Abdul Razak Gurna's work. 
On the one hand, he gives his characters stories to tell, but on the other hand, there's a lot of silence. A lot of his novels deal with silence. Even in title, some of his stories, there's silence. I think that makes sense because people who move countries or people who are displaced, they don't want to tell their stories of the past. They want to forget the past and they want to start a new life. And that kind of makes sense for a lot of refugees and migrants. They want to keep their trauma suppressed and silence is the only way to cope with that. By embracing a new country, a new culture, they want to have a new identity. But unfortunately, on the flip side, a lot of these people find their host country or new country is very hostile to them. People are very hostile to them. So they don't really feel any belonging to anywhere. So this feeling of loss and this feeling of in-between is very prominent among refugees and immigrants. And that also adds to the silence because they feel lost and alone. I think a lot of refugees and asylum seekers find it very difficult to express their pain and suffering because they think nobody will listen to them and nobody will understand them. And that's why they keep silent. So Abdul Raza Gona gives voice to a lot of these voices people, tell the stories of a lot of these silent people who struggle with their new identity as well as their past. So a lot of refugees and immigrants find them perpetually lost between the past, the loved ones who are left behind, and their present, which is the local people being very hostile to them. And they find it very difficult to cope with these two different pulls and pushes. And I think Abdul Zagurna's stories and novels giving refugees and immigrants a human face. And I think that is commendable. And I think his Nobel Prize is very much deserved. Thank you very much.